Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Who has the first question? Mr. Brandon, can a person raised under adverse, deprived, and oppressive circumstances who has retained a spark of rationality and who at middle age has come across objectivism and responded positively expect to become through individual efforts an emotionally whole human being without professional help? Well, I think there is a possible confusion implicit in the inquiry if I understand what you're after. Learning or agreeing with a philosophy of life, even let's assume that it is a rational philosophy of life and one that is authentically understood by the person, doesn't thereby guarantee freedom from personal psychological problems. Philosophy and psychology are two quite separate domains. You know, I'm glad to have a chance to comment on your question because a lot of people I meet seem to have the idea that if only they hold the quote right unquote philosophy of life, that puts an end to all psychological questions and all psychological problems, and it doesn't. I know people whose philosophical ideas I think are very sound indeed. But I cannot say that they are necessarily any psychologically better integrated than people who hold philosophical ideas that I regard as mistaken or mistaken in important respects. Therefore, philosophy is not a substitute for psychotherapy. Now, if children are raised by rational principles from a very early age, that can certainly help in their psychological growth. And even as adults, learning a rational philosophy of life be helpful. It might clarify confusions. It might provide the intellectual support of a rational, comprehensive frame of reference from which to view the world and the world's events. It might help to take away guilt caused by religious influences. And all of that is very useful and very important. So I'm not suggesting that philosophy cannot contribute to a person's psychological well-being, because it can. But I am trying to caution you against the idea that philosophy by itself is a psychological cure-all. So, coming back to the middle-aged person in your example, that would depend upon where that person was at psychologically at the time that he first encountered the philosophy of objectivism. If that person had significant psychological problems, then the mere fact of having a positive response to objectivism or studying it conscientiously and mastering it would not put an end to those problems. So now we come to the last part of your question. Can a person resolve personal psychological problems without professional help? That's a harder question to answer because it depends upon which person we're talking about. One person might be far more successful than another at knowing how to work on his own, on his psychology. I believe that as time goes by and more and better books are written on psychology, specifically addressing themselves perhaps to the question of what individuals can do on their own, it could be easier to do more without professional help than it is now. But I couldn't give a more specific answer than that, you see. Because, as I've already indicated, it would depend upon the psychology of the individual person, what materials or information he had access to, the complexity or difficulty of his problems, and so forth. If a very young child is being reared in an irrational manner, is it inevitable that he will repress his painful emotions? I am inclined to say by the best of my present knowledge, that if a young child is subjected to a high degree of fear and or pain and or really acute frustration of his legitimate needs by his parents, while I cannot claim this as a certainty, 
I will say that from where I stand today, and to repeat what I've already said, in the context of my present knowledge, I believe that it is virtually inevitable that some degree of emotional repression will take place, which the child will feel is in effect necessary for his own preservation. He will feel he needs to somehow put up a distance or a wall between himself and some of his more agonizing feelings in order to survive. And this, of course, is very relevant to his subsequent psychological development because it gets him into a pattern which, unfortunately, he can repeat at a later time when he would have other weapons to deal with pain. So it can be a very tragic situation. But certainly there are some cases that I have heard of or know about or can imagine where I would declare right now of these reservations, yes, given that degree of shock and trauma, it's virtually inevitable that the child will repress and will need to repress in order to protect his sanity enough to continue to live. Then there are other cases where I cannot claim with certainty that it would be inevitable, but where I would say I am inclined very strongly to suspect that it would be inevitable. And I wish I had made this point stronger when I discussed this problem in the psychology of self-esteem. I took a more moderate position in dealing with that question in the book. And today I would view somewhat differently the problem of the young child up against an irrational environment. In other words, when I was writing the book, I was more inclined to believe that to some extent the child's complicity is always required for the neurosis that develops. Today, I'm more inclined to believe that circumstances can arise which a child simply has no weapons to deal with. I don't mean by that that his mind is destroyed or that he had a completely wrong thereafter, but that he will be hurt and damaged to some extent. Today, I'm inclined to think that much more can happen to the child when he is in a young, helpless state than I saw clearly at the time of dealing with this issue in my book on self-esteem. Mr. Brandon, if a person had been exposed to a great deal of irrationality during his childhood, and had come to regard this as the normal, what problems might he encounter in a romantic relationship? Any number. He might have a generalized fear, fear of being hurt, fear of being rejected, chronic suspiciousness, chronic anxiety, feeling that who knows what his partner might choose to do. Those are certain obvious ones. He might, because of this childhood exposure to irrationality, be so bewildered as a child and uh, feel so helpless that it might leave him or encourage him to have a generalized sense of inability on his part to understand people or to judge people or to evaluate people, which could end to leave him feeling helpless and ineffectual in all human relationships and therefore very specifically in romantic relationships it could undermine his confidence in his ability to understand people, which means undermine his confidence in himself and in his own mind. It could result on his part in a doubt that he can ever be close to anyone. It could produce, in other words, deep-seated feelings of alienation from other people, of being cut off from other people, Therefore, the whole notion of intimacy would be very unreal to him, very strange, could make him feel very uncomfortable, or perhaps he wouldn't be able even to approach it or understand it at all. The point I'm trying to make, you see, is that exposure to massive, traumatic irrationality in childhood can be damaging to a person in any number of ways, and when you have said that, you obviously appreciate that that damage will also manifest itself in anything so intimate and important as a romantic relationship. Indeed, virtually any psychological problem that we have sooner or later up in a romantic relationship for the very simple reason that that is where we are most emotionally and psychologically naked. That is where we have our most, shall we say, lengthy or protracted interaction with another human being. 
and therefore where any personality conflicts, fears, or doubts sooner or later are going to have to make themselves known. So it's difficult to say if a child is exposed to traumatic irrationality, why then when he grows up in a romantic relationship he will have problem X. Because he can have almost any problem in the book.